Man, it is a gift to be here with you. I graduated from here, and I, I guess I am living testimony that God could take some knuckleheads and do something with their life. I met my wife. We became friends on an ISP trip. I guess that's a shameless plug. It still works. We actually didn't, uh, there was no ring by spring. It was after spring, so I guess uh, that's hope for some of you out there too. But this is my family. I have a picture. Uh, yep, there they go. Yeah, you all say all, but you could pray too because <laughs> grocery bills are going up. Mixed babies are the cutest. I'm sorry. I'm a little biased, but you know. Um, but man, I love my kids. I have four kids all under the age of seven, um, and we decided it was a perfect time to plant a church. So, um, but that's my family. About a year and some change ago, I had the chance to take my kids, uh, my oldest two, um, to Disneyland for their first ever roller coaster experience. I got it on video, but um, I, I have a couple photos. So I want to show the first photo. Just, they were really excited, y'all. This was, this was like the roller coaster in Toontown, so I started them young uh, just to kind of get them acclimated. Uh, but as, as the video kept rolling, uh, the, the tune quickly changed, as you'll see in the next photo. <laughs> so <laughs> I really tried hard to turn my son into a meme. You know what I mean? Like, that's probably how some of y'all still look after El Monte, huh? Y'all, y'all, it still, it still, it still does that thing to some people, right? So it was a really fun experience, really a great time. But the thing is, what you don't know is my son Leo here, when he was two weeks old, we had to take him to the emergency room because he was having trouble breathing. So when you see your two week old having trouble breathing, it does something to, uh, just to you as like a a new father um, in this whole experience. And the, the, the hard part was, we would go from like doctor to doctor. This doctor would tell us to take inhaler A. This one was like, why are you taking inhaler A? It needs to be B. And this one's like telling us about inhaler D. And I'm like, I didn't know that existed. Don't y'all like, didn't y'all go to the same school? Like I'm trying to figure out why you giving di- different diagnoses. And the hard part the whole time, none of it's working. And we're like seeing our son labor and breathing. So he probably had 12 ER visits in the first like, year and a half of his life. And so finally, my wife and I were like, hey, like, we want to go to the asthma breathing specialist. Can we like get an appointment with that person? And so we did. It took a couple months, but we had a chance to get connected to a specialist in breathing. And when they looked at my son, when they checked his lungs, when they checked just his body, she knew immediately what kind of program he needed to be on. And so we have a program. Every day he has to take certain things, and when things start to flare up, we give him this particular inhaler, but when things get really, really bad, we give him this inhaler. We had a plan. And in the next four and a half years of his life, we've only had to go to ER once. And I say this because I believe in our culture, in our day and age, especially with y'all, Gen Z, and, and the college landscape, many of you are struggling to breathe. And, and our world and culture is telling you to go after this thing or that this thing is gonna help you breathe better or this thing is gonna help you just find more purpose in life. This thing is gonna satisfy you. And the problem is you keep trying out these other elements and the world is wanting you to go to other elements instead of submitting to the specialist, the specialist of your soul. And so tonight, my hope is no matter where you're at, no matter how you're breathing, that we get to go to the specialist of our souls because I think he has something to say about how you and I are to engage this world because I love that you are at CBU. As an alum, I had one of the best times of my life here, but I would be foolish to think about giving you a word that would help train you so that life outside of this incredible place, you will be a little bit more prepared for it. And so if you would open up the word with me to Mark chapter two, we are gonna 
discover a story of four friends who decided that they wanted to bring their friend to a specialist. In Mark chapter two, starting in verse one, it says, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, it says they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law, these religious people, they were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, brother, get up, take your mat, go home. And he got up. He took his mat, and he walked out. It says, in full view of them all. This amazed everyone there, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. At this point of time, Jesus was metaphorically during that time trending on TikTok. He had just in the previous chapter healed a bunch of people. So people have seen his healings go viral. And so they are like, yo, we got to get to this man who is healing people, who is making people who cannot walk, walk, who cannot see, see diseases their entire life. We need to get to this man. And so we enter the scene where these, th these four friends, it says that they bring their paralyzed friend carried by all four of them. Now, I want you just to consider what these friends must have been thinking at this moment. You're carrying your friend who is literally dead weight. And I don't know, it doesn't say how long they are carrying him, but they show up to the place where they, they're going to the specialist and they show up there and they can't get in. I imagine maybe they could have been frustrated at this moment because it was a long journey consider what, what they were determined to do. Like they could have been like, man, we, we walked all this way. We should have grub hub this miracle, set it for like ETA at 634, and we would have just showed up, put you on the thing. Jesus would have healed you. We would have set, we would have set this right. But they travel, and then all of a sudden they get there. There's no room. But here's what they knew. We need to get our friend in the presence of this man named Jesus. That was the goal. And here's the other thing you need to know about this. During that time, to be associated, to be connected to someone who was paralyzed actually would have brought about a lot of cultural shame. Because people who were paralyzed during that time they, they were known to be paralyzed because of some level of sin or something in their life. So if you notice, people who had some sort of uh, diseases or they were paralyzed or they were blind or different things like this, they were often the outcasts of society. So now we have these four friends, not just carrying their friend from a distance and seeing what's happening at this scene, but they carried him knowing that many people in that community would have been pointing their fingers and looking at them as to why they were associated with him. And I think it, it begs us to consider this question for a minute. It's really easy and it's really preferential for us to try to carry people, to try and expose people to the presence of Jesus who are very similar to us. People who look like us, maybe come from the same cities or cultural backgrounds as us, it's really easy. I mean, like, 
I, I, was, I was walking a little bit of the campus as I got here, just kind of reminiscing. But it's really easy to associate yourself with groups and people who look just like you, come from the same places, are on the same teams in the same hall. Y'all like the same stuff. But I think it's, I think it's, it's, it, it's a different level of faith when you're willing to engage with people who many people, you know them, They're on your hall, the people that someone's talking about that's coming in late at night, the person who you would describe as maybe a little awkward or weird. I think think it's those types of people that you're not naturally feeling led to be associated with that God's looking at you right now and say, but will you carry them into my presence? Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, It says, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create community. I think we live in a society today that people that get on your nerves are people that are different than you. The world and society wants you to see them as a barrier to your peace. Oh, you can mute people on social media. You can unfollow people, you can even block them, or you could do the thing where you like unfollow them but they don't know, like you've muted them but they don't know that you've unfollowed them just because you don't know if they got one of those apps that'll tell them that you unfollow them, then it's like, oh, I gotta have a conversation now. But you can't do that in real life because what Jesus wants us to understand and see is that people are not a barrier to your peace but they're actually a bridge to your sanctification. And this whole idea, if you're not familiar with sanctification, it's you becoming more and more like Jesus. The people on your halls, the people in your apartments, the people in your classrooms, the people that you may, that may rub you the wrong way, they are not a, they're not a barrier to your peace. It's a bridge to you becoming more like Jesus because he wants to know if you're willing to bring his presence into people that you don't like, into people that are not your preferred people. And here's the thing that these four men modeled, that when you are not consumed with the approval of man, you can see things with your faith that nobody else can. They were not concerned with how people could be looking at them and ridiculing them as they were bringing their friend. They were not concerned with that. They were probably not even concerned that people saw them traversing the side of this building, climbing him up onto the roof, could have been pointing fingers and like, yo, what are they doing? They did not care about what other people thought. What they cared most about was how can we bring our friend into the presence of this Jesus? That's what they cared. Galatians 1.10 reminds us, that are we trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Are we trying to please people? Because if we are still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Picture how hard this must have been. They, they carry him, they, they climb up to the top, and then it says they have to dig a hole through the roof. If that was not exhausting enough, they have to now dig. And one German theologian, uh, Eckhard, says in his commentary on Mark that these homes, they were built with undressed basalt stones, smooth with plaster, They would have been supported by sturdy wooden beams. They would have been covered with beds of reeds coated with layers of mud. So it wasn't like they just like, like, it wasn't like it was like quicksand that they were dealing with. No, they had to dig and they had to dig and they had to dig because they knew again, if we could just get our friend into the presence of this Jesus, something could happen. I believe in our time today, digging is going to look like prayer. Are you willing to dig and dig and dig so that the people that are far from Jesus, that the people that get on your nerves have an opportunity to be exposed to his presence? Again, I think one of the dangers of society is that we can create these echo chambers of communities 
that when things get a little bit hard, when that person doesn't respond the first time to you sharing your faith with them, when that person doesn't respond politely when you're trying to serve them, that you would just give up and not keep digging, not keep praying. But it says they dig and they dig, and all of a sudden, they lower their friend down. Now, again, I want you to picture this. Like, I love scripture. It creates such beautiful imagery. Yo, it's not like they just, like, dug this hole and was like, all right, bruh, good luck. You ain't going to feel it anyway. They didn't do that. Like, I, just imagine, just imagine with, you, they carried him. They took him onto the roof. They began to dig, and then just ever so precisely, they lower him down into the presence of Jesus. And you know what I love about Jesus? He's not like some of these pastors today that get so mad when, like, babies cry in the audience. He doesn't look up and he's not like, yo, who thou interruptest my wonderful preaching. Like, he's not even tripping about that. He looks up and he says, it says in verse five, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Can I ask you a question? How do you see faith? I thought Hebrew said that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen. So how does Jesus see faith in this moment? I imagine that he probably saw the sweat dripping down their face. I imagine he probably saw the, 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 uh, the zealousness, the earnestness that they had just seeing their friend being lowered down. And I imagine some of their eyes like lifted up with hope because they said, oh, this is the man. We are about to get him into the presence. Something is gonna happen. Whatever it is Jesus saw, he says, because I have seen your faith, the sins of this man are forgiven. And I imagine, too, these friends are like, yo, Jesus, like, we appreciate that you just said that, but, like, we, didn't, we, didn't, we did not carry him all the way over here. We did not climb this thing. We did not dig for you to forgive his sins. We ain't taking him back, Jesus. So you're going to have to heal him, and he's going to have to walk up out of here. Because we ain't, we, uh-uh, it's too late. We, it, this was a one-way ticket. Jesus understands this. He knows his greatest need is the forgiveness of his sin, not the healing of his body. Jesus knows that his greatest need, this man's greatest need in this moment it's not the healing of his body, but the forgiveness of his sin. Because why does it matter if he's able to walk and then walk straight into hell because he's never professed Jesus as Lord? But we have to be careful because we would all probably say, yeah, you know what? We agree with that. That's really good. But today, especially in our society and church, we, are, we love trying to change people's behaviors before we actually see their hearts transformed. And can I tell you the thing, that, the thing that I love most is that you have decided to come to CBU. You have decided to be under the leadership of, of people like uh, Morgan and, and Jacob and Brian and Nick and Brett and all the team here. That you have surrounded yourself with incredible godly people. Like it is like there's nothing else like it. But the thing that I, would, I really would need to caution you because I have seen it, I have lived it, I have seen students struggle with this. There is a trap of performance in Christian spaces where you will get really good at modifying your behavior because you know just enough things to say. You know just enough verses to memorize. You know just enough decent things to say in the Bible study. You know just enough. And if you are not careful... Christian spaces often can create a place where you perform for God instead of being formed by God. You have to get this deep into your soul because this must be a place where you are formed by God, not perform for God. And the problem with this in Christian spaces is that you're often really not aware of it. You're often not aware of it until you leave it. 
But this is not a place for you to come and perform and throw your hands up and, 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 and act as if like everything is okay and then you go home at night and you're empty. You're still questioning if God is even real and exists and that's okay to, to process that. But the thing that I fear most about y'all is that you get into this performative element where you have, a really cur- you have a really curated Christian social media, but your soul is not curated and in love with the Savior. I think that's one of the things that I, that I just, I, I, I felt over and over again as I'm, as I'm like thinking about coming here, as I'm thinking about all the students that I have engaged with, that the second they got out into society outside of this place, Oh man, there's no more performing. Were you trained to to run this godly life? Or were you just a trained act, actor or actress, waiting for the approval of the next Christian group that you get in? Like these places are traps at times. I remember I was sitting in Simmons Hall lobby my freshman year as a student. I had got to CBU on a basketball scholarship, so um, I was a pretty nominal Christian at the time. Like, I think I liked Jesus, but he wasn't like Lord. I was, I kind of compartmentalized him. And I had made some mistakes my freshman year. And I remember sitting in Simmons Hall, first floor lobby with this girl that had uh, twerped me. Do y'all still do twerp? Is that a thing? No? Wow, that's crazy. Okay. Thank God we got to experience it because I got free, we got free dates, so it was great. And this girl had twerped me, and I was, I, like, I, I had the biggest crush on her. And we played this game in the lobby, um, never have I ever. It's like you put your fingers up. I think that's how it goes, right? Never have I ever. And the goal is to see, right, who has the most. And, like, again, Christian spaces, you think, man, probably all y'all going to have your hands. What, what are we going to say, never have I ever ate a mango? Like, come on, that's not how you play this game, Right? So all of a sudden, it starts to, the intensity of the questions start to pick up. And then someone breaks the ice. And the question goes something like, never have I ever had sex before? And so now, I mean, yeah, as you feel the tension right now, that's what it felt like in in that lobby. Because little did they know that two weeks prior to this, I had made a huge mistake that I had never thought I would make knowing that I grew up in the faith, knowing that sex outside of marriage, I knew that that wasn't how God had designed it. But here I am sitting in this lobby with, in front of the girl that I have the biggest crush on. Do I put my finger down or not? And then she proceeds to say with her friends, oh, thank God none of y'all put your hands down. I could never be with a man who had had sex before and wasn't a virgin. And, and I'm, not, I'm not telling y'all, go look for a non-virgin. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is just, I, I just want you to sit in the, in, the, in the awkwardness and honestly in the shame that I experienced in that moment. Because essentially what she was saying and how she said it and her posture and her tone was that, man... I'm not going to be good enough for her. Therefore, I'm not going to ever be good enough for God. And the performance was birthed. No one knew. All of my friends, my first, no one knew what I struggled with. It wasn't until my junior year where God had to break me free and I got to understand the beauty of the gospel. But I think as a follower of Jesus, you can create spaces where people will either get to bring their whole person or they're gonna have to bring a persona. You have the opportunity to create those spaces for them. When you bring people into Jesus's presence, when you understand it, that the the main thing that he's after is forgiveness of our sins, then you would actually delight and welcome people to bring their person and to bring their mess. Imagine how that conversation could have could have changed. Imagine how it could have shaped me if I had to put my finger down and they said, oh, okay, wow, tell, like, what, like, what is your experience 
in dealing with this, do you experience some level of struggle or shame? Like, because they could have seen, they could have read it in the room. But what they did, because they created a space that I had to bring my persona, it led to me performing so many years of my Christian life. And I'm almost positive many of you are performing right now. You have a persona that you have put up. And many of you, if you're a freshman, you came in, and, and it, this is kind of a pressure-filled situation because many of you came in and you thought, oh, man, this is a t- chance to reinvent myself. My friends from back home, they, they, they knew stuff about me. This group doesn't. So the persona comes up. You're a junior. Some of you are about to graduate, and you've been carrying this persona for four years, and you know exactly how exhausting it is. You see, these places cannot be spaces where people feel like they need to perform for God. Because that's what the religious leaders often did. So if you look at the main text, who were the people that was questioning everything that was happening? It was the religious people. It says, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Listen, this is the height of the moment here in Jesus' ministry. Who can forgive sins but God? And if Jesus is saying he can do this, then what he's saying is that he is God in the flesh. And this is about to spark, this is about to be the avalanche of many issues that the religious people have with Jesus claiming to be God. So he challenges them with two questions. He says, why do you question this in your hearts? And it's crazy because it reveals that Jesus knows what they're thinking. And so you would have thought that would have been a clue. Like you're sitting there and you're like, man, what is this brother doing? And then he's like, hey, why do you question me? It's like, oh, hold on. Did I say that out loud? You would have thought that would have been a clue. Then he goes on to say, the question, which is easier? The saying to this man, your sins are forgiven because it's something that they could not see. How do you see someone's sins being forgiven? So that would have probably been the easier one to say. Or do I tell him to get up, take his mat, and walk? And that's exactly what Jesus does. He says, get up, take your mat, and walk. Because the internal change, the internal transformation that you just experienced in your sins being forgiven, I'm about to give people external proof. Because you are going to stand up and you are going to walk out of here in front of everybody. Only Jesus could do this. And here's the thing about the religious people during Jesus' day. Their theology, the way that they thought and believed in a coming Messiah, coming to save the world, coming to heal and restore, they were the closest people who actually believed what Jesus believed. So you would have thought in this moment, they would have turned and looked at each other and be like, yo, I think this is the guy. I think this is him. But they didn't do that. They had questions in their hearts. They refused to see Jesus for who he was and who he truly is. And here's the reality. You can have a front row seat next to Jesus and still refuse to see him for who he truly is. You could sit in the front of chapel. You could be the one eager in your D group or your C group or your B group, whatever group y'all call it these days. You could always be the one sitting on front in the SL nights, and you could still refuse to see the power that Jesus could have in people's lives. You see, the religious leaders, what they did during that time is they were more concerned with themselves looking impressive than, than, than people being impressed with Jesus. They would wear these longer robes. They would wear these longer tassels. They just wanted everyone to know, like, yo, we're the summa cum laude religious people. Just these long tassels. They would wear these boxes on their heads with the laws and different things just to show people how much they knew. You could do the same thing here. You could show everybody how much you know, but if you are not formed by the love of God, You will not walk in power and see God move in power. You can have the right content and have the wrong conduct. You could be way more cynical than you are hopeful for what God can do in people's lives. 
Like if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you should be the one on the hall looking at all the people that are coming back drunk or throwing up in the, sh- in the parking lot or going to the clubs at night. You should be the people who are most hopeful that they can get into the presence of Jesus because they live on your hall. They live, in, uh, they live in your apartment area. They live on Tower Hall with you. You should be the people who are most hopeful. But again, the problems in being in these hyper Christian spaces is that you could turn into an accidental Pharisee and not know it. Because you're cynical about what what God can do in people's lives. You question it, actually. When you refuse to expose people to the presence of Jesus, you are simultaneously questioning God's power to transform them. That person that you know you probably should have asked out to lunch by now, or you probably should have checked on and seen how they were doing because they came back and they were angry or they had an attitude towards you. That person that's on that sports team that you think they're only here because of the sports and not because of Jesus, well, why don't you expose them to Jesus? Why don't you open up your life and help bring and usher the presence of Jesus into them? Because one of the best evangelistic things that you have as a follower of Jesus is your transformed self. It's one of the best things that you have to offer people. But when you refuse to engage with people who are hard to engage with, who are more frustrating to engage with, who honestly just bug you, when you refuse to bring the presence of God into those spaces, you are questioning his power to transform them. You're questioning it. I believe that the measure of your spiritual maturity is not how much you know. I believe the measure of your spiritual maturity is how willing you are to carry your enemies on the mat. It's to carry those who cannot do anything for you on the mat. I just believe the level of your spiritual maturity is gonna be seen in those students on this campus who are struggling and on the margins. And your level of maturity is gonna be seen by your willingness to love those who are really hard to love. You see, the kingdom of God does not skip over people. It doesn't skip over cultures. It doesn't skip over socioeconomic lines. It doesn't matter how how much scholarship that you got to come here. It doesn't skip over any of that. The kingdom of God is not simply of talk. Scripture says it's of power. And so my question to you as I wrap up is, who are you in this story? Who do you find yourself living and acting more like? Because if I'm being honest, I believe a lot of us, if we, like I believe many of us, if not majority of us in this room, we're like, of course, we want to be one of the four friends. Man, we want to carry people into the presence of Jesus. Like, that's what we want to do. But here's something I also need you to recognize what Jesus says here. And many scholars argue this, that Jesus says when he saw their faith, he also was talking to the man who got on the mat. Because do you know how much faith it takes to allow people to carry you? Do you know how much faith it takes to potentially be pointed at and ridiculed and your friends pointed at and ridiculed, knowing that you can't carry yourself, you can't climb up this house yourself, you can't lower yourself? Do you imagine, can you imagine how much faith it took for this man to get on the mat, knowing that he was going to probably travel a very long way and he possibly could not have been healed? It takes so much faith to recognize that your sin has paralyzed you from being able to walk with God. That your sin has has paralyzed you so that your good deeds and your religious morality is not good enough to reconcile you back with God. That it was God having to send his son Jesus to, to die on the cross for you so that he could be the mat that is used to bring you into the presence of our Heavenly Father because you couldn't do it on your own. You needed to be carried by Jesus. And do you recognize how much faith 
it continues to, to take to believe that. It takes so much faith to allow yourself to be carried by a community into the presence of Jesus. When you refuse to get on the mat, you're, you're saying that your sin is too much for the Savior. Honestly, this is what I think the Christian life is. I think the Christian life is carrying, you are the four, you are the four men carrying people into the presence of Jesus, but you're also getting on the mat yourself and being carried into his presence. Two years ago, I had to be, I, I had to have so many people carry me into the presence of Jesus because in a matter of six months, I had a botched surgery that got infected that got into my bloodstream. My wife was about to give birth to our fourth kid. We moved into the city. We were planting a church. Someone backed into my car. Our house flood, our, our bathroom flooded. We only had one, and I had to live with my in-laws for three and a half months. I needed people to remind me of Jesus' presence. I needed people to carry me into his presence because I was feeling hopeless. I was feeling ashamed. I was not feeling qualified to do uh, this whole pastor thing and starting a church. I believe that many of you in here will not heal some things because you will not reveal them to others. I had to reveal my sin and my shortcomings and my doubt to people and be carried into the presence of God for about six months and, and honestly, I'm watching my father-in-law uh, be a dad to my kids because I was on a walker for four months, debilitated, walking in shame. But if it wasn't for, for God forcing me onto the mat, reminding me that the gospel power actually is the thing that will sustain me and it still works, and reminding me that there is so much power in God's grace and that it's actually sufficient. And I think my fear is that many of you will not make a habit of getting on the mat in your life. You won't make a habit about repenting and, and believing in what Jesus has done for you. And so you'll just go on performing. You'll go on doing your religious things and you'll never have a true, real encounter with the God of the universe. And many of you, you are going to be what I call the roof crashers. You are going to bring people into the presence. And I just want to encourage you to keep digging. Because the person that you're trying to reach, you may not reach them year one. You may have to dig year two. You may have to keep praying year three. But guess what? Maybe by year four, Jesus becomes real to them. And they actually are willing to get into his presence. And as I said before, I think one of the best evangelistic tool, tools for you is going to be your transformed self. I remember the first time I got a chance to share the gospel with someone. It radically shifted my life. It was a Muslim young boy in Malaysia, and I was on an ISP trip. I had quit basketball at CBU because I felt like I needed to be obedient to God. And I remember this kid would come around Every single day, we would play basketball. And I remember constantly sharing the gospel with him, constantly laying it out, this time eating stingray, this time drinking mango lassi, this time eating curry naan. Like, we're just, I'm like, brother, what do we need to eat for you to get this? Sharing, and then one time on the fifth time, he's like, you know what, this sounds really good. I think I'm gonna add it. I'm like, that's not how it works. You can't add Jesus. He has to be everything. And he says, no, Jay, I don't think you understand, man, because if I make him everything, then my family is going to ostracize me. And so, like, I know that that sounds good, but I, I can't make him everything. And, and I just kept, Lord, I feel like I just got to keep bringing him into your presence. You are calling me to dig right now. You are calling me to pray. You are calling me. So on the sixth time, I share it. He has more questions. Finally, on the seventh time, the last day before the trip, he accepts Jesus. And it was the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. Because every single one of us has the chance to reveal God's kingdom where you, where you live, where you go to class, where you work. And for me, I didn't recognize the significance of what that meant until I saw it firsthand. 
And for two years, this young Muslim boy would lie to his parents and tell them he was going to take photos with friends on Sunday, and he was going to church. And so while I'm sitting in the hospital struggling, needed to be carrying to the mat, I get a WhatsApp from him. And he says, Jay, I need you to pray for me because I'm about to tell my mom that I've accepted Jesus and I follow him. And it's been six years. And so I pray for him. And he leaves me a a voicemail the next day. He says, Jay, I just want to say thank you for your prayers. I shared it with my mom. And she pulled out a knife and began to chase me with it because she said, how dare you follow Jesus? And he said, Jay, I still think I made the best decision I've ever made in my life. This dude's about to get married to a woman who loves Jesus. The parents aren't approving of the wedding, but it wasn't the first time the gospel was shared. It wasn't the second time. It wasn't the third time. It wasn't the fourth time. It was the seventh time. And then God used him to encourage me while I was on the mat. I was in the hospital suffering to remind me that the gospel is still good news. And my prayer for y'all tonight is that that would be the thing that you center your lives on. That you would just want nothing more than to, but you wouldn't want to point people, carry them anywhere else but into the presence of our king. And that you would make this a place, a, a, a section of CBU where people can bring their person and not their persona because they are not performing for God, they are being formed by God. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this space. God, we ask that if there are people that need to reveal things and get on the mat, that they would not wait another day to do that. God, would all the people in the groups tonight create a safe environment for people to reveal the things that they are navigating in life? And would we all just remember that the number one thing that we could do for people is expose them to Jesus? Would we not run to podcasts or YouTube or all these other short form videos or all these other appetizers, but would we run to the main course and that is your presence through your word and through your church. And so God, I pray tonight that, that people would stop performing and they, w- they would make the shift in their hearts to be trained and formed by you because that's the greatest thing that they could give their life to. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Let's give it up for Jay. Thank you so much.